that's the intent of this series, just to just bring these wonderful, uh, uh, wise, knowledgeable professionals so we can listen to them and learn from them. And we couldn't do better than uh, my friend John Dryden, who yeah, have as ah. much respect for as any musician I've ever played with in my life. And I've played all over the world with a lot of musicians. So uh, 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 John is a pianist and a songwriter. He's, he's, he's played jazz. He's played pop. Uh, um, he's taught uh, and uh, he's currently teaching at San Jose State uh, University and at Santa Clara University. Yeah. Um, and uh, he he has his own uh, uh, groups out and and um, um, and then uh, Ren Geislick is brand new to me. Uh, I just <laughs> met her because John asked if she would please come in and do this lecture on the role of the keyboardist uh, uh, or the band leader to the vocalist, but also including. Uh, the rhythm section. So John will talk about the rhythm section too. So uh, Ren uh, st started out as a, a jazz singer, and then she's morphed into being a singer songwriter as well uh, in different genres. And that's kind of funny because I've been a singer songwriter and I've morphed into playing jazz. So we're, kind of, we're crisscrossing. So without yeah. uh, uh, further ado, I'd uh, like to introduce uh, 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 Ren Geisick and uh, John Dryden. Thank you Yay. so much. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Yes, Thanks. I see the applause. Oh, one, one, <laughs> last yeah, thing. See? Un, one, one last thing. I'm sorry. Undo, uh, uh, turn your video feed off if you are not lecturing right now. If we get to a question answer session, turn it right back on and remember to unmute your mic if we do that. But for now, turn your mics off and turn your video feeds off because it'll give us more bandwidth. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Great. Okay, so even though my screen says Louise Bettner, I'm at the home of my friend Louise, who has beautiful Steinways graciously loaned me the space. Um, thank you, Rick, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, okay. There's Louise. Hang on just a minute. I okay. Actually, rename. You don't need to rename it. They know who I am. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, you know, they, it's in the it's in the bio. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, I just uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, Ren and I have been working together for six years, I believe. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I think so. But it hasn't been that long yet. It I has been has. that long. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, we've done a lot of recording together, done a lot of gigs here and in LA and New York. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of stuff. So we have a simpatico between us. And this is one reason I, even though she and I cannot play at the same time due to the wonderful technology uh, factors, um, <laughs> she can at least demonstrate things that singers can do to be better. And I can do things to make instrumentalists better. And, you know, we're yeah. going to have a little back and forth. And yes. of course, any questions? Yeah. Um, exactly. Bren, would you like to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, John and I met at a jam session, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today is kind of jam etiquette and um, so, some things specific to singers, some things specific to instrumentalists. Um, as Rick said, I um, started out in jazz. I studied jazz vocal performance at Cal State Long Beach, and um, I actually teach jazz vocals at um, San Jose State. Uh, and yeah, John and I met and it was like an immediate connection at the jam. And it's really important to make those connections so that yeah. you can find your band and you can find the people that you work the best with. And I, in order to make those kind of connections, you need to um, know how to interact at a jam session. So we're kind of trying to talk about some of that stuff. And um, John and I have recorded, he, he recorded on my album. We've recorded, I've recorded a bunch of songs that John's written and um, we've just uh, had this really great relationship for the last six years, <laughs> my goodness. And uh, it's been fostered by our, um, our kind of jazz background that morphs into all these other things. And it's so funny that jazz was 100 on that list because jazz influences influences it all i think yeah you know it influences everything and somehow it's at the bottom of the most popular genres list i don't know that seems weird it's you know the blues and then jazz that is those are the american first american art forms exactly yeah so, totally you know, <laughs> um 
So uh, Ren, uh, Ren mentioned, so we met at Cafe Stretch, which I hope comes back. They had a Sunday jam session. Me too. And the one thing I noticed, you know, I was playing piano and the reason Ren stood out aside from being a great singer and performer, she counted off her tunes. She was authoritative without like being, yeah, she knew what she wanted. She knew how to cue. She's going to talk about this. Yeah. Um, and she had great charts. So, you know, yeah. just being a great singer, that's good. But when you have all that extra stuff that Ren presented, then you're like, ah, I want to work with you. Yeah. So, Woo. Ren, yeah. you want to talk about uh, yeah. more about that? Totally. So, okay. So we've got a couple of different sections here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some jazz basics. Um, I, uh, I, you know, it's so funny because this is like a very diverse group that we have here, I think, in terms of skill level and what you've done in music. Um, but basics are the American songbook. What is the American songbook? Those are all the jazz songs that people do, right? Yeah. Um, those are the tunes that you call at a jam session or that you call on the gig. Um, and it's mostly songs from old musicals. John got me this great book. Is it Alec Wilder? Is it Alec, Alec Wilder? Wilder. Alec yeah. Wi Wilder? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he, and it, and it describes all the different songwriters, like the most famous ones um, that are in that American songbook, which isn't an actual book. It's just like a set of songs. It's kind of confusing actually. It <laughs> is, yeah. <laughs> it's a set of songs. It's like the songs that people do in the jazz idiom. So you need to have some familiarity with that and you can find those um, from real books. Uh, you can find them by listening to jazz artists um, and listening to different performances. It's pretty easy to pick out the songs that people do in um, that are a part of the, the American songbook. The other thing that I wanted to sit, talk about is um, if you're gonna sit, play on, one really important part of jazz is improvisation. And so whether you're soloing on your instrument or scat, doing a scat solo vocally, um, you, th those are like the important aspects of like a jam session typically, right? Usually people are soloing. If you're a singer, you don't have to scat, but it's like recommended, but you have to practice that in advance. And so how do you practice that? How do you, um, do? are you just using your ears? Are you um, using motifs in your, in your scatting or improvisation? You know, playing the changes is really important once you get more advanced with the harmony aspects of it. But even if you're a beginner and you're, and you're using your voice, you can use your ears to get you to the right notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can start out like Louis Armstrong with the, with the melody <laughs> as your guide and go off of the melody to get there with that improvisation and soloing. So there's, there's like a, the beginning part of all that soloing and improvisation is, um, is starting out with that melody. And then another aspect is melodic variation. And for a singer, for me, that's really important. It's also really important for instrumentalists too, but um, as a singer, if I'm singing, usually at a jam session, you sing the tune, the, which is also called the chorus or the head. <laughs> you, you sing the head and then there's a bunch of solos and you could solo on that if you want, you could scat. And then you sing the head out. And on the head out, I typically try to do melodic variation, meaning I, I adjust and change the melody based on the lyrics of the song um, to kind of bring out more meaning from those lyrics and from the, the tune. So you'd kind of use inspiration from the original melody, which you've learned hopefully very, very well before you've come to the jam session. <laughs> and then uh, kind of use that to inspire your melodic variation. Um, so, okay. Do, could you demonstrate eight bars of the way you would sing a standard, the first eight, say, sing that first eight as if you were singing it the first time, close to the melody, and then sing a different form of those eight bars? Sure, John. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot play and sing at the same time due to COVID and uh, Zoom. Okay, it'll be an acapella version. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, okay, uh, I thought about you is one okay. that I that just popped into my head. I don't know if you guys know that song, but it goes, um, I took a trip on a train and I thought about you. But, but then it did. 
I passed a shadowy lane and I thought about you. Okay, so that's how it normally goes. That's pretty close, right? Am I close? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then if I was doing melodic variation, maybe I'd start from above and go um, one, two, three, four. I took a trip on a train and I thought about you. Mm -hmm. I passed a shadowy lane and I thought about you. Anyways, and I'm also swinging it, if you can't tell. That's like the ba doom, ba doom, ba doom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a yeah with melodic variation it's kind of based on the lyric and what obviously what fits within the chord um but so i really love love messing with the melody and doing cool stuff but you also don't want to be like riffing a bunch within the jazz idiom it doesn't make sense to do like mariah carey riffs in the middle of a jazz tune so things to consider <laughs> that's a giveaway that you're not a study jazz singer and <laughs> yeah. it's that's the same thing from jazz to rock or pop if it's knowing the idiom mm -hmm. and I always tell a, a friend of mine said the only thing worse than john coltrane playing black sabbath is black sabbath playing john coltrane mm -hmm. which is like just means like neither one of them would totally understand the other idioms and they might make something cool of it, but it won't fit most likely. As great as both those artists are. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, so we were gonna talk about, um, uh, do you wanna talk more about the where the tunes come from or the what a lead sheet is? Oh, go on. You can go on to the next okay. one. So this is my this is my plug time. So if you <laughs> any of you have questions on uh, what a lead sheet is, um, you can refer to my book. I'm actually <laughs> a published author. Total plug. <laughs> um, uh, it's published by Alfred Music, uh, available on Amazon and all those places. It's called Reading Lead Sheets by John Dryden. And so a lead sheet is the melody of the song the chords of the song written above it, sometimes below it, and some if the lyrics, if the lyric, there are lyrics to the tune. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all written on one stave of music for the most part. It's a musical shorthand, musical shortcut. Ah, thank you, Suki. Um, <laughs> there's the link to the book. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, it is just, a, it is what we musicians, jazz musicians especially use for really just playing through any tunes. You can just hand someone a lead sheet or even just a set of chord changes and you mm -hmm. can count off the tune and bam, there you go. Um, so the lead sheet is just a crucial thing to know and that like I referred to Rand, she had great lead sheets. <laughs> she had great charts when she came to that session six and a half years ago. Yeah, and, and uh, just to plug some other things I um for my for making my lead sheets that were that are in my big jazz book that I had all the songs in I use Sibelius um there's also finale and muse score that people use for those um and the cool thing about writing your chart out in one of those programs is that in addition to the basic lead sheet you can add a coda or an ending or an intro or you can add little things. You can even change it and reharmonize it if you want to get real crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. And you can, yeah, <laughs> change the keys. You can do all sorts of stuff with that. Um, a lot of times I'm an old hover, holdover 20th century boy and I do handwrite a lot of things. Um, so yeah. that if you've got decent penmanship, which I don't always possess, <laughs> uh, but I still do it. Uh, that's always a nice thing if it looks good. The main thing is to make your music presentable and easy to read. Yes. Um, I have written tunes that were written on cocktail, cocktail napkins. I've read all sorts of stuff, but if you come and you're brand new, whether you're an instrumentalist or singer, and you've got all these new people, like here's a piece of music and they'll yeah. immediately look at it and it reflects on your ability in their perception as to what your music looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's a it, there's we're going to talk about a lot of ways that people can 
know right away if you can hack it <laughs> at a jam mm -hmm. session, you know, and there's ways to come prepared so that people will know that you can actually lead a band and you can get in there and do the jam session without, and, and there won't be any train wrecks. It like calms everyone's nerves to know that you have a chart that's in the right key, that has everything on there that we need to know and that's clear to read. Um, some other resources that are really uh, good to know about are real books, which are like physical. In fact, let me grab mine, one sec. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, the real book was uh, created, it is a fake book. Okay. Now, the fake book is a really a collection of lead sheets. Yeah. The book was created at the Berkeley College of Music. There it is right there, um, my alma mater. Uh, it was intended to be closer to a lot of uh, the original standards and putting them all in a book. Everything else, it was an illegal book until mm -hmm. Uh, just uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, um, you had, I used to, I bought one at Cabrillo College, a guy, you had to go around the corner and give him 20 bucks. And <laughs> it so was, uh, it was a total, like, felt like a, you know, some, it was illegal, in a way, um, <laughs> because they didn't, the original ones were just totally pirated, uh, but it was the standard, it became a standard. Now it's legal, every, all the stuff is above board, and they get, the songwriters get royalties. It's great. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, when I got my real books, like my, before I had like physical copies of the ones that work for me, um, I got them from like a, somebody's, uh, flash drive. So it was also kind of pirated, like, woo. Yeah. And I've collected like a whole file of like all of the fake books. They call, also call them fake books, fake books, real books, um, all these different just music books with like, with the lead sheets that are typically American songbook tunes. Um, for me, we're going to talk more about this later, but I use the the low voice real book. So these aren't in the original keys. Like instrumentalists play the tunes in the original key, and um, vocalists obviously you can pick the key that works for you. Usually for women, the low voice book is really good. It's typically good keys for women. Um, the original keys are good for men usually. <laughs> or they Isn't were that nice. <laughs> They were written for sopranos and old Broadway shows. Yeah, exactly. Different style of singing. Exactly. But yeah, we can throw a sexism angle in there too, just to yeah, be uh, yeah. You know, hey, definitely, it, they definitely catered to the guys. Yeah. Um, um. Oh, the other thing is another resource that people often use, and you'll see at a jam session. Although we're are we're encouraging you not to use this, but um, okay. is iRealBook. And that's like a, an app that you can have on your phone. In fact, I could pull it up. Um, it's a very cool. handy thing. It is, yeah. changes are correct 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that 1% is a really bad thing. If, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a, overall, it's an extremely useful tool. Totally. And you can change the key um, first. You can you know go to a song that you wanna play. You can change the key. You can change how fast it is. You can hear a playback. So if you're practicing improvisation or um, scatting, it's it's especially useful for singers because you can change it to the key that you're going to sing the song in. Um, you can practice scatting. You can pra practice melodic variation and just singing through the tune um, and kind of it, it's a really nice pra practicing tool. Um, and it's cool because you can change the tempo. So if you need to do like tempo del lerno, mm -hmm. that works well. Um, and if you need to, you know, if you want to speed it up and see how fast you can go and, um, and it gives you different styles too. So you could sing it as a swing or bossa or whatever, whatever you style you're trying to go for. Um, all right, John, should I, like I move on to what the I'd next like thing? I'd like to say on that oh, on. with the standard songs, um, one great reason, especially when you're vocalist or you're unfamiliar people, sometimes it's nice to have a chart because no, just about every standard song from the Great American Songbook, there are people have different ideas of what the chord changes are. Now, there, they could be from different versions of the song. You know, a standard is something that's been recorded numerous times. So they're not necessarily going to be the same chords. When you've got a Mariah Carey song, to bear, you know, go back to that, you know what the chords are. But when so many people have recorded and maybe reharmonized standards, 
you when you get on a bandstand, somebody is always going to play one chord that's a little different. And it's kind of up to you to like be ready for it. Usually it's not a big deal. Um, you know, there are just little things that some people do. Uh, like on I Thought About You there. <laughs> Jimmy Van Heusen too. So the, you know, that is why we do it first time. And most of the time, but not everybody does it, is they do it what we call the tritone sub. It's a, uh, it's little things. And I always go with what the bass player is doing, unless it's totally wrong. And so much of this is not an exact science. And that's, that can be a really frustrating thing because you're like, oh, I should be able to go up. I've practiced this tune. I know I got rhythm. I know how to do it. And somebody does something slightly different and it might mess with you. And it's up to you to be able to roll with the punches, go with the flow. Sorry about that. My, my computer was running out of battery. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> I was panicking for a second. But thank you for filling it, filling in time. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I am gonna. Do you want me to move on to the next thing? Cliche John? number one. Cliches. Okay, so one thing we want to tell you about is avoiding jazz cliches. <laughs> avoiding cliches. Um, one cliche that I can speak to, um, because I. Um, I'm a singer myself. <laughs> and this was the one that my teacher when I was in school often was just trying to get us to not be this, the cliche of the chick singer. And it is totally sexist that people think that all chick singers, you know, have these, these things, but you're fighting an uphill battle. So you might as well come prepared. Yeah. Um, so things, things that you need to avoid. Don't be the singer who doesn't know what key you sing the song in. Make sure that you can count off the tune. And so uh, I think we're going to talk about count offs and how to do that a little yeah. later too. Um, and then avoid songs that don't inspire or are cliche. So there's songs like um, Fever is one. Uh, great, Never. fun song. Never. It's, a great, it's a great song when Peggy Lee does it in her very specific way. It's a great song. I, I mean, I think it's fun to listen to, but if yeah. you aren't going to sing it like the coolest version that anyone has ever heard, don't do it. Don't even, I mean, definitely don't do it on a jam session, like ever. That's, that's a no, no. And there's other songs like Summertime, also a great tune. But if you come with Summertime as your tune for a jam session, you better have the best version of Summertime ever or you might you should be doing something more interesting with it than just like a slow ballad version of summertime don't come um, in with a janice joplin version like you oh just, my gosh exactly and, that's and happened also, i feel like i've witnessed that at a jam i've witnessed that um <laughs> it's also like you can tell when they're they're a singer or instrumentalist is just used to listening to one version of a song such as that yes. and um then it immediately makes every, uh, assuming everybody else knows that version, then they, it's really constricting. However, if that singer person is not, you know, nobody knows that particular version, then it could be a train wreck, which means things get jumbled up. <laughs> yeah, because some of those versions have very specific endings. And if the person on the bandstand isn't able to cue what that ending is supposed to be, um, you're going to end up with a problem. And like, I've had people come up to me at shows and say, hey, can you play some Frank Sinatra? And that's all well and good. Like, I kind of know what they mean. But a lot of those songs have been done by other people. Mm -hmm. um, and those songs have can be done in a different way. They can be done as like the way I do it, the way Ren does it, right? Yeah. Um, and it, you know, like one of my examples that I said here was like, don't go up and say that, don't introduce a tune as an Ella Fitzgerald tune when it's a Cole Porter tune. I mean, yeah, Very she's saying a lot of Cole Porter tunes, um, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, you know, we love Ella, but it's not her tune per se. There are a few that are surprisingly written by, you know, 
by particular singers that are awesome and that would be the right description but not in that case um yeah so that's that's just another cliche that i don't you got you got to make sure that you're uh Get, have anyway, your own kind of thing have your own take on it listen to, to multiple versions of song yeah never stick like it it's like you're only gonna listen to ella doing uh, uh I got how it. high the moon that ain't good you have to listen to a whole bunch of versions yeah and i always like to go back to the earliest version and i like to go back to the original sheet music mm -hmm. doesn't mean i'm gonna play it that way but I like to get to the source whenever possible. Mm -hmm. Another thing too is like if you if you only learn one version, then you're just sort of stuck in a rut. If you learn a ton of versions, you it's okay to steal. It's okay to steal ideas that you think are cool, but you can steal like one little idea, one tiny thing from one version, and then maybe you steal another little thing, and then you come up with your own thing on another part. You should be mixing and matching, mm -hmm. in uh, not not taking off complete thing um because it also shows the band that you are uh that you're new <laughs> i mean it really it's like that you're new to to singing in the jazz style so and rick i saw you said something i couldn't quite read it we can get to that about what does a noob do how do you react with a with somebody who's brand new or or like beginning level and how does that person act on a bandstand? How do the more seasoned performers act? Um, we could talk about that right now if you want, Ren. What do you think? Um, sorry, what was the question? So, oh, sorry. just in terms of being, uh, if you are a new person to, like, if you're a young up and coming or, you know, like somewhat mm -hmm. inexperienced, you've mm -hmm. played pl jazz, but you haven't done much with jam sessions. Mm -hmm. um, what would you do as a singer? How it, like, what else would you say to a singer besides the stuff you've talked about, tempos and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. um, what does that person have to do to exude confidence and tell the band, I know what I'm doing, even if you don't? <laughs> yeah. Well, it takes some practice at home. I mean, I would practice in the mirror. You're also, this is something we're, we were going to say anyways, is that it's a really good idea to go to a jam session one time and just scope it out before you decide to sing or before you decide to sit in. Um, um, I had a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I just wanted, what does the band leader do when confronted by the noob who only knows Johnny Hartman's version of my one and only love, which would oh, be yes. someone like me, because, because you're in the moment. And obviously that person is not going to change. You're not going to teach them in the moment. What do you do? Yeah. So I, thanks, Rick. I yeah. say that's a piano player uh, or guitar player uh, question. Um, <laughs> the piano player is, uh, I don't know how many people are basketball people, but the point guard is Steph Curry. <laughs> you dribble the ball out. You set up the plays. So you're like seeing the whole, you'll seeing everything. It's like the catcher in baseball. Um, the piano player is kind of calling the shots. And when I'm playing, I'm making eye contact with everybody. I'm looking, I'm seeing what's going on. Uh, when a singer I can tell only knows my one and only love by the great Johnny Hartman version, because I'm really familiar with that, I will go along with that interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much stuff that happens on the spur of the moment. A piano player makes 25 decisions a second. We, but it's built into our just training. Um, when you have somebody, you, if you know that version, I just reference it as much as possible because I am there to support the soloist. It's not mm -hmm. me against the singer. It's not me yeah. against the saxophone player. Yeah. Even if it's like some some guy I hate or something, <laughs> I'm there to support. Every You take all your issues away when you get on the bandstand. You're yeah. there to make the music better. Yeah. And, I've okay. seen you in situations where, where it's, you know, it's one of those cliche songs or it's one of those, like they're doing a very specific version. I feel like I've even seen you, John, like yell out what chords to play to people. Yeah. I've uh, done another sports analogy, given an audible. It's like, <laughs> I can tell the singer has gone somewhere. The saxophone player has jumped. Sometimes mm -hmm. 
somebody, a new person will screw up a form. We'll come mm -hmm. in on the bridge when it's really the second A section. They'll jump eight bars. And if the bass player doesn't pick up on it, I will yell something out um, to say second A or yeah. down to the bridge or something like that. Yeah. Um, because yeah. you're there to say, support the music and the person. And if you have to yell something out, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. I think there it's are all fine these other to just... little gestures that it's going to be hard to tell that on Zoom, but little things that sort of lot head nods do a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I saw another question here from Rick about um, making key charts in my own key as a singer. Um, so, okay. If if I go to if I go to a jam session at this point in my life, if I go to a jam session, the question is, uh, you mentioned making a chart in your key. Do you have a good comeback for band members who grouse about singers, especially women who don't sing in the right key? <laughs> Few of the standard keys are good for female voices, which is true, right? Most of the standard keys are not good for female voices. Um, they're too high. They're not conversational. Um, they may be conversational for a, a, a male voice, but just for women's voices, it's just not the right key. And it'll sound bad if you do it in that key. So honestly, if somebody try, well, first of all, I wouldn't work with that person and I've got gigs to give. And if somebody treated me like that on a bandstand, I'd be like, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm not going to have you in my band. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that's, but, and that's their bad for being you know, not being friendly. <laughs> but you um, also know uh, what uh, Ren is also a real pro with is that she knows a lot of tunes in keys that are relatively easy and she knows which ones and knows the keys when she gets there. Yeah. And you've said before, like you have four tunes, like, or Sarah Gazarek has also said this, I've heard you say it. You mm -hmm. have four tunes in your head when you go up on a session, it's not mm -hmm. like you go up and you only know one tune. Yeah. It's you're ready with a bunch of different stuff. And if somebody mm -hmm. doesn't know it, then you don't freak out and you're like, oh, right. let's do um, How High the Moon instead. Yeah. Yeah. I usually have like kind of a list in my head. I also, when I'm at a jam session as well, like picking a song, you know, if you're going up as a vocalist or a horn player or something, you're picking the tune for everyone to play. If they've just played like the fastest tune ever, I don't know, tenor madness or something. Um, <laughs> if they've, if they've just played the fastest thing ever, maybe you want to play something a little bit more medium, or mm -hmm. if there's only been fast things all night, maybe that's your opportunity to get to sing a ballad. Cause normally at jam sessions, you don't get to do a ballad. Um, but if everything has been fast and, and it feels like that's the right call, you can try to call that. Um, and like John said, if people don't know it or don't want to do it, or for whatever reason, just have a couple more options up your sleeve. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. And like she said, if you said they've just done a ballad, don't come up and do a ballad. No. <laughs> you can get away with two medium swing things in a row. You can sort of get, get away with two, um, even eighth bosses, sort of, depending mm -hmm. on Latin kind of thing in a row. But um, two ballads, you're going to lose the audience. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that, and this may be, John may, may have a different opinion about this, but if I do a ballad at a jam, I kind of assess in the beginning who wants to solo on it. And I just do one solo, maybe mm -hmm. like maybe two people splitting the form on the solos rather than having like the whole song a million times for everyone to solo on a ballad that is not necessary <laughs> if at a ballad, jam session. If your ballad is over seven minutes long or eight minutes long, I think it's defeating. <laughs> it's not That's a good call. Like, yeah, you don't want to do more than three choruses, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And I hope um, it's helping uh, any other questions on this, keep throwing them out at yeah, us. Yeah, questions are cool. Um, the John, do you want to go on to some of this other? Let's see, did we already say this? Yeah, um, just the jazz communication and etiquette. Yes, so are you, uh, you want to say something about the first bullet point there? Yeah, so let me just, um, <laughs> uh, so when you get to a jam session, I'm gonna go, uh, uh, from a piano player's point of view. If I mm -hmm. get there, um, I'm assessing who is playing, um, Okay, is there a kid on drums so I can tell if it's my tune to call? Is there a kid on drums so I can tell is kind of inexperienced or if the bass player has already played or he or she is like, um, 
little tentative. Uh, I won't call a tune to you're not uh, you're not competing. You're not calling something to make them feel bad. You want to play to their strengths. Mm -hmm. um, the etiquette uh, and professionalism is um, for one thing: be early, be nice, <laughs> be decently groomed, be ready for the occasion. Um, you know, yeah. uh, Ren and I are, uh, I've taken to dressing a little nicer for gigs just because it does make an impression. Yeah. Um, and you know as many songs as possible. Mm -hmm. Ren, did you want to talk about the uh, knowing your tunes and the prep or? Um... Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yes. Did you, so one, so kind of what John was trying to say just there is like, this is like a little quote that I heard there's three things that are really important to get the gig and, and you're, you could be getting gigs at the jam session, right? So if you, you have to behave yourself well, you have to be like easy to work with at a jam session so that somebody might want to hire you someday. Right. <laughs> That's like, might be only get one chance. If you blow it, they're like, yeah, oh, I he's mean, the guy who screwed up Olio. Why would I call him? Anyway. Well, and it's not even about that. It's like, were you nice to, I yeah. mean, were you nice to work with? So the things are like, are you a good hang? Which is like, are you nice to work with? Are you like a good, nice person <laughs> that people mm -hmm. like? Are you talented? Talent matters. Um, are you professional? And if you have at least two of those three things, you're gonna have a better chance at getting the gig. It's best to have all three of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's really important. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So we've already said a lot of this stuff, yeah. but- Willing to communicate, this is on the list. Um, yeah. When you are on the bandstand, if you are just have your eyes closed and you're only focused on yourself and you're not paying attention to the musicians around you, both listening and eye contact, mm -hmm. um, for one thing, it doesn't look good and you're going to be, I just call it the myopic jazz, where you are just in your lane and you're not seeing the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about listening to what everybody else is doing and knowing everybody's roles. The drummer Indeed. keeps time, the bass player also keeps time, lays down the harmony, and the piano player and guitar player give you the harmony. Yeah, um, and the piano player and the guitar player have to communicate, right, John? Yeah, about this who's is also, comping. It's also a thing that uh, I don't get talked about too much, but piano players and guitar players, especially if it's a jazz thing and you're playing a swing tune, um, you know, especially like, you know, when you're, when you're young or new to jazz, you want to just be playing all the time. And it really doesn't work so well when piano players and guitar players comp at the same time. Uh, and if a comp, comp just is short for accompaniment, meaning you're giving the chords, you're playing the chords. But if you're both playing at the same time, it's going to get really busy and you'll clash. And the that goes along with the communication on the bandstand so that mm -hmm. you're looking at each other. I always motion to the guitar player if we don't know each other, I'm just like, go ahead and comp and I'm not gonna get in your way. Um, um, all yeah. these little things, if, you, if you're nice on the bandstand, you're probably nice in person. That's true, that's true. And uh, I, I like to say, and I learned, this is something that was a revelation to me when I figured it out or when I was told it in college was, yes, nonverbal com communication on the bandstand is really important. So those head nods, those, that eye contact is all really important, but you can also just say out loud <laughs> to mm -hmm. somebody, Hey, do you want to take a solo? Hey, like head out. We're going, you know, I like to tap my head when I'm doing the head out, head out, we're going. Um, or, you know, this is like the code assigned, but if people aren't getting what you're laying down, like if they don't, aren't getting your nonverbal communication, you can talk, you can say, Hey, Coda, like <laughs> we're going now. Um, and I think people get afraid to do that. And it, it, but it's, a uh, it's definitely a necessary thing. And it, it can, it can make things much more smooth if there's some confusion about what's happening. Um, I just saw that Jane asked, uh, I couldn't read all of it, but I think it was, uh, are there more uh, jam sessions for beginning players? Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, everything is off the books right now because of everybody knows. Yeah, so there's nothing right now, but I know, I know, it, so I live in San Jose, so, and I know this is more based in Santa Cruz. So John, maybe you know more about 
any jazz well, I mean, Rick has Cruz? the, the Santa Cruz Jazz, jazz Society, the I knew the Bocce's one. We used to have the late uh, Kurt Stockdale. We had a few around town for years. Um, you, you know, can... there aren't many. There was one in San Jose um, at the uh, Little Lou's Barbecue. That was more beginners. That's closer to the beginner thing. Uh, and don't expect, uh, you know, jam sessions to make you better. You can create your own. Once everything <laughs> gets back to normal. Um, yeah. You know, right here, we have a bunch of great musicians, really cool people. So there's nothing preventing you from getting together and playing music um, yeah. together at home. Uh, totally. You know, that uh, is the original say, jam. <laughs> yeah, personal jam. It's always a great way to start. And then when you get on the bandstand, you're not going to be as scared. Um, yeah, I think there's... So, okay, this says, Suki says, the Jazz Society jams are very welcoming to new newbies. Um, I think you one of the keys for the jam session like figuring out if you're gonna if it's gonna work for you 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 need to go to the jam and not sit in just go and listen and sort of see see what the vibe is and who's leading the jam um and if you do that you you'll probably figure out pretty quickly if it's gonna work for you or if you feel comfortable and you're only gonna have a good performance at a jam session if you feel comfortable um it's sort of it's the same on actual gigs if you're going to have a gig out in the world um which i think is our next <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that our next thing? Just said early on in jam sessions is a better time to go if you're more of a beginner and that mm. i've definitely found that to be that's true. true that's true um uh realize that jams and bars are performances they are you know and it also goes along with jam session etiquette of too often we spend more time standing around trying to think of a tune than we do actually playing. So yeah. um, that quote was, uh, we, it's still a performance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just because it's a jam session doesn't mean it's necessarily, you should think of it more casually. But yeah, yeah Ren, let's, uh, let's move on. You got it. <laughs> okay. So uh, John and I worked to let, to, together a lot on, um, on gigs, like actual, like professional gigs out in the world, like at, well, back in the day <laughs> when there used to be gigs. Yeah. Um, and there's different kinds of gigs. Um, and if you're the band leader, uh, you need to kind of figure out what type of gig this is. Is it, um, is it like a background kind of vibe where they want something a little bit more mellow? Is is the are you picking the right music for that venue and that experience? Is it um, you know a private event where they want a very particular sound or in a, a specific vibe, or is it your own featured gig where you get to shine? Like a lot of the shows over the years, we've gotten more and more. We've had more and more opportunities, John and I, to do shows where we can yeah we could do jazz or we can do our original music and we can kind of we can kind of do what we want because it's an actual seated audience that is there to listen to you specifically. Um, if you're doing something for a private event or for, for like um, a restaurant or something, you have to kind of consider, I don't wanna, you don't wanna pull, you have to sort of figure out if it's appropriate to um, do the big song that pulls all the attention and um, does the big thing. So it's sort of picking, taking into account the audience when you make decisions on your set list and kind of how you're going to approach the performance. And volume. And volume. Uh, really, important. if you're playing, you know, in a restaurant, a background gig, even if it's sort of a jam session, that's not like a huge stage. A lot of jam sessions, um, you know, are in bars or restaurants and it's not the focus of the whole thing necessarily. And if you're playing really loud and it's a tiny room where people are actually, you know, you're not the center of attention, uh, it's a no, no. And, yeah. you, and if you, you know, you're playing. What you want to do in those situations is be like, be the perfect volume so people can hear it, but it's not overwhelming, but also playing awesome stuff so that even though you're meant to be background music, the audience is like, wait, what are they doing? That's so cool. Yeah. What's you should tell the story about, um, you, you should tell the story about the Empire Cafe or whatever. Oh, the Empire Diner. 
Empire Diner. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the, the I Bowie lived in one. New York for 19 years as playing as a musician, doing all sorts of really fun stuff. One of the one thing I had was 13 years uh, for the most part. Every Sunday, a Sunday brunch from 12 to 4, I played solo piano at the Empire Diner, which was this classic old Art Deco diner in Chelsea. And I could just show up and play whatever I wanted. And it was a Sunday brunch, which is when you have the worst people out in the world. These are the amateurs. <laughs> it's the amateur hour in terms of like people who are night. Everybody's grumpy. Tourists, wants to probably. about music, you know. Yeah. It's not like people are into tipping. And I'm just playing. And I'm not banging away. I know there's a lot of people doing other stuff. So I'm in the background. But it was my, um, because I wasn't super in everybody's face, I could learn a bunch of tunes, which I would just work on stuff. Um, and a few times I actually connected to people. Um, my Tell friend, us about the one person you connected there's to. There's the one person uh, <laughs> I was playing and I came back from my break and the manager's like, oh, don't look now, but there's somebody at, at the counter. And it was David Bowie and his wife, mom, and pro a friend who might've been Tony Visconti, the great producer. Uh, so I'm like, oh, hell am I going to play now? Uh, <laughs> he's, you know, one of my musical heroes. And uh, I just started playing, I was playing standards, you know, so I'm doing Great American Songbook. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to play any Bowie songs. I'm not going to draw attention to the fact that this guy is here. But I'm going to play music that influenced him and that he grew up loving. So... Mm -hmm. I started playing British pop tunes, you know, doing the Beatles. <laughs> I played Across the Universe by the Beatles and I saw him lean back and look in the mirror. And he was the first person to ever applaud me at that gig. And it didn't happen <laughs> very often. Um, I love that. He loved that and he loved <laughs> Angel by Jimi Hendrix. He gave me a few other nods. So I just played music that I knew, you know, it was sort of this under, undercurrent thing I wasn't and I wasn't I didn't go up to meet him I just played stuff under the radar I but love then he brought the whole audience in all of a sudden people paid attention yeah well uh, yeah when David Bowie's paying attention to you yeah but I wasn't pounding it out yeah I that's just, so cool you know, it was knowing what the audience is what the gig is right you don't square peg round hole all that thing yeah. And I think, you know, that leads into the next bit here, which is putting together a set list, which John is really good at this. He describes, he's a real big baseball fan. So he describes these things as in terms of baseball with picking your set list and sort of how it should go. Yeah. <laughs> um, not to get super sportsy, but in baseball, <laughs> your leadoff hitter, which I consider your first tune, should be something that's catchy. The leadoff hitter gets on base and he, he's fast. Mm -hmm. So you want something that draws people's attention. You do not put too many things at the same tempo in a row. You close, you begin and you end on the faster, brighter note, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And yeah. then in, in between, it's all about adjusting to tempos, keys. You have your tunes, you know you want to play. And then you're like, I always say, okay, we're going to put this thing, we'll put this ballad in the middle. Mm -hmm we know where the slow things are going to be. Um, and it, it's really just, uh, you, you think you hear the songs in your head. You're like, hmm. you want this little like curve going through. You want a curve. I hear the ending of the beginning, the beginnings and endings of each song. And okay, will that go into my one and only love? Well, yeah, it will. Let's put it there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And how are we doing on time, Rick? I see we got like nine minutes. Does that include any other questions or? Do we just keep talking and then? Well, you know, what I was going to say is it's really open ended. Uh, okay. It's like we can go over if you'd like to go over and, and just just be natural and do what you wanted to do and end when you want to end. We're fine. OK. Um, well, we got, yeah, we got we got a lot to cover. Let's see. Oh, oh one thing I wanted to say was um, if you know, we've talked a lot about jam sessions and jam sessions are a particular thing because you're going in and you have not practiced with this band. You don't even know them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you have to kind of count off the tune, cue the ending, um, 
do all these things just to try to like make it all work. Um, but if you have an actual gig, we recommend you rehearse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you can rehearse in person before a gig, that's awesome. If you can't, and you have particular songs that you want to do that are more unfamiliar, you need to send those songs to the band in advance so that they can practice. Um, and that's part of that professionalism of being a sideman is showing up prepared, um, you know, having the songs down. I, I went to New York um, with John in January. That was my last trip but before all this went down, um, went to New York and we played at this cool at uh, Rockwood Music Hall stage three, um, which is a really cool stage. And I had played before with the with John, obviously, with the guitarist and the bassist. Um, the guitarist is, is from New York. The bassist is Aaron Caceres from Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I had never played with the um drummer before i just sent him all the songs and it was like a lot of original music and he and nailed he, it he came so prepared i mean i was like dude and he was kind of he wasn't my first the first call that i made because i knew a couple drummers in new york that i had played with before and i had called them but then ended up getting a recommendation to call this guy josh and he was like awesome he was so great. And it made me think, man, I'm going to definitely call him again when I'm in town. He's so good. Yeah, um, so it's just, it's part uh, of that professionalism thing that's really, really important and cool. Um, and yeah. I just saw a question of how, so in a solo, uh, like solo piano with vocal, that was a question. I couldn't see the whole thing, but uh, can you, can you cover some musical? Oh, we were going to talk about this anyways. Yeah. Can you cover some musical techniques for solo piano and vocal? Yeah. Well, as a piano player, first thing is you support the singer. If you're not supporting the singer, you're not, you're not supporting the music. And then the muse does not like you. Uh, the, <laughs> and you usually walk a bass line when you're playing with me, just solo piano and vocal. Yeah. Um, so with piano and voice, the, the beautiful thing of the piano is that you cover, you can cover everything. The hard thing is that you can cover everything. So mm -hmm. It is such a, a point of taste as to how, what exactly you want to do mm -hmm. um, musically. So Re there's going to be a delay, but Ren, if you could tell me a tune, we can't play together, but right. tell me a tune and count it off. Also okay. tell me if I, so a tune, just like we would on a gig, but we don't know each other. That's hard. Yeah. Um, what's a good song? I don't know. I'm I don't know. I don't know. Right what now. do you know? Let's do I Should Care. I Should Care. I think I, I do it one. in B flat. B flat? Okay. Yeah. What do you, uh, do you want an intro? Yeah. Can I get the last four bars? Okay. For intro. That's a very okay. basic intro, but cool. that's fine. And uh, I'm going to do it as a swing, a me like a medium slow swing. So um, one, two. Uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you have to say it. Go so yeah. what I did there was she counted it off great. I knew it was a swing. Even if she hadn't said swing, she yeah. said B flat. I know the song, last four. I played the last four bars as an intro. Yeah. And if I did, so I did a really like a kind of grooving medium swing and that's what John gave me. This is like important. This is an important thing to realize mm -hmm. as a singer, whatever count off you give, if you give a really timid count off, you're going to get a really timid mm -hmm. version of that song. And if you're not swinging that yeah. hard in your count off, you're going to get a really not that swing and thing. I mean, which it could be fine. Like you want like maybe a light swing feel. Um, so you do something more like, um, one, two, one, two, three, four. Yeah. yeah. See how I did the difference is like she so I swung it a little harder. I dug in more on her first count off. And um it's because I listen. Not everybody is going to listen to your count off intently. <laughs> They're yeah. not always gonna get the tempo right. Yeah. But the stronger you are, then you have no excuses. Then it's like, oh, that guy didn't pay attention. Um, 
<laughs> but to, you know, the the stronger the count off, the more likely the band is going to be able to get what you you were throwing down. Yeah. Exactly. That's like a really good thing to point out. Um, John and I have gotten to the point in our musical musical communication where if we're doing a duo gig and I'll say something before the gig, like, hey, like, let's do some crazy key changes and stuff. And we'll like catch each other's eye in the middle of a song. And he's like, da, da, da. <laughs> we'll just like change the key in the middle of the song. That is very advanced, I must say. But <laughs> but it's because we've gotten really good at communicating with each other. And we can just use our, we can just look at each other and be like, yeah, we're doing it. Yeah. And I, and I feel like because I know John's playing and he knows me, I can follow him when he does something like that. And even on an ending, if I don't cue the ending um, or I don't have it written out, um, with if we listen to each other we can come to a nice conclusion together just by listening to each other and kind of understanding where we're going and you know I'll cue like this is the last time we're doing whatever we're doing um and that was a question just now aside from a, a coda um which is really just that's its own ending it's an arrangement you know so not mm -hmm. to but I should care, and I that's the original that's the yeah. ending that song mm -hmm. but if uh ren's if i'm gonna do um so ren does one thing this means keep going it's a tag i want a yeah, tag a tag so the tag is uh, So the, like the interesting thing is, if you're playing with a band, she could be doing this. There are a couple of different variations on that tag. Yeah. You know, but I always, you know, I look at the bass player. Sometimes I look at the bass player's hands. And it's like, mm -hmm. bass player's going to this note. I'll be like, ah, I'm going to do <laughs> the two chord instead of the, the one chord. You know? Right. And I think like on when I'm, if I want to do a tag ending, I usually start doing this motion at the start of where I want them to go back to. So if I was going to do, I, um, what's the, what's before that? Um, what's the words before that? Like, uh, and I'll, so I'll like, what's, I can't, I can't remember the words right before that happens, but. Um, yeah. As, as lovely as you. Uh, oh yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, just I, I don't know why that this and is bothering I saw me. And I question the uh, the sub. There's a question of uh, what chords do you do as a, a tag chord? Um, in terms of uh, uh, theoretical things, instead of going yeah. to the one chord, what I'll do is go to the three minor instead of it being a one major chord. I'll do a three, six, two, five. And that becomes a tag. And you can do that indefinitely. Yeah, so I was like, we're gonna keep going, just keep on, keep on keeping on. And then when I went like this, it was like, okay, now we're, this is the last time and I want you to go to the end, you know? And I could do this and then I could conduct the end to make it slow down if I really wanted it, like, just kind of like, it's not like real conducting, but you know, just sort of slowing everyone down. Um, or I can do like, uh, you know, this and be, I should care. And I do, dun, 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 you know, like a break. I should care two, three, four, uh, and I do, whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, All these little cues, and some of it, it's just like if you, like Ren said, going to a jam session first and watching what they do. I always, I've sat with students or, you know, young people, and I'm like, okay, observe what's going on here. Tell me, or my friends who are non musicians, 
okay, tell me what you see without knowing anything about music. Who looks like they know what they're doing? Um, <laughs> who, who's like, well, yeah, I can see they know, but they're not quite communicating correctly. It's mm -hmm. all about these little things. And you learn these over time. Totally. And yeah. some of it is just, you have to experience it on the bandstand. And sometimes yeah. it's embarrassing. But and there's some and there's some things that are hard to communicate on the bandstand in a jam session like and John you may have an answer to this question yeah. that I'm asking now um I I have a hard time communicating a vamp ending I've had I've actually like just leaned over my shoulder and said like do a vamp what when I want to vamp yeah. at a jam a jam so vamp is yeah There's not like a hand signal for that. Uh, a vamp is often people automatically will play them on say, you know, Girl from an Ipanema, mm -hmm. which is on the do not fly list. Don't call that on a jam. <laughs> I don't like that song. Sorry to everyone. I'm talking else. to them, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll vamp on that. You know, and then- Well, it's easy, to, it's easy to get a vamp at the beginning because you can just tell someone I want to vamp in the intro. But if you want to vamp at the end, I always struggle with that. And I usually find myself just using my voice to say vamp, like vamp right here. Yeah. It's up <laughs> um, to musicians to listen to what, really, if you're not listening to the singer and yeah. you don't know the tune and you're not listening to the singer, um, you're not going to get a lot of these cues because I will listen. I'm like, okay, we're coming up to the end of the form. What's she going to do? And immediately I react to what I hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there's sometimes too, where John will make a choice, um, like an artistic choice about how the ending, like the, he'll make the initial choice about the ending. And I, because I've, I can, I've listened to a lot of jazz. I understand the jazz idiom and I understand kind of some of these different ways to end the tune, I can just sort of pick up on it and, and like fly in with him on that. And then maybe I'm cueing like, this is the last time we're gonna do it or something like that. But like, he's instigated something and I'm, I'm following with it. So it is, it's a two way thing. It's not like you're, I'm the singer. So everyone has to follow me all the time. And unless I'm cueing something specifically, but if I'm, if I'm go up for the moment and figuring it out on the fly with everyone else, then we don't need to, um, you know, I can, I can follow John. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have to follow me all the time. <laughs> As a piano player, I can, I can make choices and I can dictate some of the shots. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't, you know, I will not say this is the only way to do it. Um, yeah. And I never, I try to not do it tune the same way every time, unless it's a specific arrangement. I was going to say that uh, as a drummer, I love it when a singer or a pianist will will lean in and go like this. That that tells me we're going to vamp it out. Yeah. You know. So I and as a drummer, I love it when singers will lean in and say vamp, or they'll be really strong yeah. about conducting. It's really great, and it's rare in jams. I find to have singers really take charge. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think people get nervous to do that stuff because because they had a bad experience. I mean, I've had bad experiences. Um, I had, <laughs> I went to a jam. This is a funny thing, but like I went to a jam in San Francisco one time and I asked, I was like, oh, do you guys know the song called Blue Daniel, which is more of like an instrumentalist song, but I have lyrics to that tune. Um, and they were like, oh, no, no, that's not, let's not do that. I was like, that's fine. How about there will be never, there will never be another you, which is like, if you're gonna do that, that's like a very ubiquitous jam, jam song, right? <laughs> that's on um, the borderline. I was like, all right, whatever. We're gonna do this tune. I'm gonna do it really fast. It'll be fine. Um, and I get up there, and before I can count out the tune, someone, this like sax player who was like sitting back in a like a lounge chair, like he was still playing in the jam, but like not on the stage. He goes, "Oh, cool singer. What are you gonna sing? I will survive." <laughs> and I was just like, whoa, dude. And I was like, nope, one, two, one, two, three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. But, you know, people have bad experiences at a jam because someone is unfriendly to them. Don't take it that personally, you know. It's a try, reflection work, of that, not you. Yeah, work on your craft, do your best, continue trying to continue putting yourself out there. And you will get better, and you will um, you will get better at the nonverbal communication part. Um, 
before you count off the tune, you can briefly mention the overall structure. Um, yeah, I do not, if you spend more than 20 or 30 seconds explaining the song, what mm -hmm. you have on a jam session, um, then it's too complicated. Yeah. With a jam session, you want to call something that people are pretty comfortable with. If you're like, oh, but I'm going to do the bridge in five, but only on the, on the head. And then I'm going to do this. A lot of these things just happen naturally. And we don't yeah. necessarily, you know, if you give three instructions, more than two instructions off top, off top, top the beginning of the song, by the time you get to the song, people aren't necessarily going to remember it. Right. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with this note here that this person said is like, you can, you can mention, like, Talking I have a written it. coda. Um, so, you know, somebody says, if I walk up in a jam session, I'm going to say, I'd like to do, there will never be another you in B flat. And uh, can we have the last eight for intro? And then I'll just count it off. So I, that's as, that's as much explaining as I normally do. If I have a chart for the song and I have a written out coda for it, then I'll just, I could say, um, I have a written coda, like use the coda. Or I'll say, ignore the coda and we'll we're gonna figure it out together. And like, I'm gonna cue it. I'll cue the ending or something. Um, but honestly, in a jam session, you usually don't have to communicate like what the ending is gonna be before it comes. You have to just communicate. Usually that's being communicated in the moment. Um, and, you know, if you want to, there's the, the tag ending, which is, you know, this is what I do for a tag ending. Um, and then there's also like the slowing down ending. So you have to kind of use your, your hands to be like, hey, we're slowing down. And then if you want to really slow it down, you have to cue like each chord as it comes. So you're really, you know, I'm trying to think of an example of that, but um <laughs> yeah john like <laughs> yes yes like like that um <laughs> um but yeah so i think you know you can uh there's a lot of different ways to do it just don't do, get discouraged i guess that's my main mm -hmm. thing keep on keep at it yeah. and honestly right now is a great time to practice because we can't get together and do real in in-person jams but these um, tools we have, with the advent of iReal, even though it has a lot of limitations and faults, it's still an amazing tool for practicing at home, shedding, as we call it. Yeah. Um, it Someone's mentioning like a Count Basie ending. Can you give, give oh, an yeah. example of what that is for everyone? Uh, so the classic uh, uh, version <laughs> of it is Quincy Jones' version of uh, uh, Fly Me to the Moon for Sinatra with the Basie band. <laughs> is one of the classic ways to end a song. Well, the other is take the A-train ending. <laughs> Jazz. Jazz. Um, and if you're a vocalist and you're trying to cue something like that, like that kind of ending, like with the Count Basie one, you need to cue that everyone is cutting out before you're done. Um, in other words, uh, I love you, but Right. yeah yeah so like you have to cue the like the cutout and you can do that with one of these Ch chop motions <laughs> uh, yeah. and a lot of times it's up to the piano player to for a lot of the endings i find myself yeah. just like um, and i'll if the singer or horn player isn't necessarily the clearest i will start to do something and just sort of set it down yeah. with some authority yeah yeah. Confidence is key. It is. Uh, <laughs> if anybody has any um, questions or anything, we're kind of, you know, we're pretty close. To yeah. Yeah. I don't so, know. Yeah, How I long mean, are we supposed to go till? Well, we're, we're past the official point. Oh, we're past the official point. Okay. If anybody has any questions or anything, we're happy to answer any of those. Kathleen. Um, hello. Hi. Hello. Don, you, hi. Have so, you have said that the wrong way to signal a bridge is this. What is the right way? bridge there <laughs> that's not a bridge yeah um, that's not a bridge what's the right way you see this this is like yes this is one way you're just like fingers crossed 
Um, there's Usually you're not queuing a bridge though, right? Because but if, if, if the singer if the singer wants to come back in on the bridge, not yeah. on the head. Oh, not at the top of the head. Okay, yeah. Would that be like even in if the... you've written even if you've written into the chart, mm -hmm. just to signal that you want to come in at the bridge, yeah. so that they don't look at you at the head like you're coming in and you're not. You're coming um, in sixteen bars works. later. The fingers crossed is one of those things. It's probably more of an East Coast thing, um, hmm. but I've definitely seen it a lot here. There's nothing wrong with just whispering bridge. <laughs> bridge, coming at the bridge. That's you what know, I say when I want to do that. If you have a chart and it's clear and you know, you would generally only go back to the bridge if it's a ballad. There aren't yeah. many times in a standard song, like if it's um, some medium swing, that you'd go back to the bridge. You'd start, right. I mean, you'd always well, start with the And often in a in that context, like if you're doing a ballad or something, you you know, you do the full tune and then someone solos over the A sections or solos over the sections before the bridge. And then you're just like, I'm coming in right now. <laughs> I'm coming in the bridge. So the form stays the same. The form is like going around and around. And someone solos over that first bit and then you come in at the bridge. Um, so I usually haven't had to signal that. And if I did, I would probably just say it. Like I'm I'm coming in at the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a little, any sort of communication is better than assuming, mm -hmm. you know, better to be, even if the audience hears it, it's better than the whole thing falling apart. I, I think thought, that the audience question. loves the inside baseball of it all. Like, I think, I think the audience likes to hear the band communicating because it's like yeah. a, a glimpse into a different world, you know? I saw Elliot said something about uh, when there is a train wreck, try not to glare at the piano player. Never glare at the piano player. Never, <laughs> never chastise the piano player because that piano player could ruin your day. Um, for one thing, a train wreck could be anybody's fault. It could be everybody's fault or just one person's fault. Yeah. Um, it could be the bass player has is just dragging or the guitar player keeps going to the bridge early. Could be any number of things. One thing is just if you are a horn player and you hear the bass player messing up, just it's okay to calmly and nicely say bridge when it's the bridge. Um, and that will happen, especially on, uh, you know, intermediate, beginning intermediate jam sessions, because people are still getting used to the idea of song form. Right. And it does, it's not a good look for like a, um, a seasoned, um, jazz musician or player to, to like glare at other people on the bandstand ever. I mean, you, I've been in situations at jams where, you know, the bass player or the drummer are less experienced and I'm, I find myself like tapping my foot, like, come on, let's go. A little bit of encouragement um yeah. and but i you know i do it with a smile and i shake everybody's hand at the end and say thanks so much you know I, you, there's no point in being like the meanie the meanie person yeah and it's it's not like it's good to be mean or demonstrative when you're a really good player but if you're a beginning player and trying to vibe an advanced player that looks even worse and huh. They I wanted, are not going to like you. <laughs> I wanted to say that um, the it, it, a technique that we developed at one point, and this was in a pop band, not a jazz band, was mm -hmm. that sometimes if you've really rehearsed something and then somebody really flubs it badly, mm -hmm. and it it can upset people in the band, right? Yeah. Well, what we learned is that you know if a monk, if a chimpanzee grins at you, they're angry at you. Right. <laughs> and so, so we developed what we call the chimpanzee grin. And that is if you feel pissed at someone, look across the stage at them and smile with a big oh my set of teeth. And you can have all the venom in the world, but the audience reads it as that you're you're being lighthearted about it. And it really works. It really right. it, you you know what you're feeling. The person knows what you're feeling. But but also it doesn't make the vibe go downhill, right. which which a glare will do. Yeah. 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 The audience does not want to see that stuff. They, no, they that wanna, is like, oof. We want to look calm and composed and happy. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that John has really helped me with is not apologizing. You know, if you make a mistake or something goes wrong, don't, you know, I've had the instinct in the past to be like, oh, sorry, or oof, you know, yeah. that or kind of, you, but you yeah, don't, you don't need apologize to apologize do in the bandstand. You don't need to do that. 
to, people, you, if you might make be you know, turned back and then to the audience and tell one of the people under your breath, or just say like, give them a sheepish grin so you you acknowledge you screwed up, but don't get on the mic and say, hey, sorry, we messed that last one up. We'll do better on the next two. Um, yep. That's never <laughs> not necessary. Don't do it. It's not. It's not. It's not necessary. I'm right now during quarantine. I've been learning ukulele and guitar, and so I find myself feeling the urge to apologize when I'm messing up if I'm like playing a live stream. But then I'm like, you know what? I'm learning. It's okay. I don't need to apologize to anybody. <laughs> I'm doing my yeah. best. <laughs> darn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Audience, audiences love vulnerability. Yeah. They they love to see people be vulnerable on stage. It makes them it brings the audience closer to you to actually make a mistake and then smile about it. Yeah. Smile like, oh oops. Dope. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, yeah, honestly, I, I found that in live streams, people love a mistake. It's weird, but yeah. they do. <laughs> and then live stream, that's a whole other panel right there. I know, that is a whole other panel. I've gotten I, I've definitely figured out the equipment for the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions down there? I see a lot of buttons in the chat, a lot of 31 in the chat. Um, I've got maybe 10 more minutes, probably tops, um, just at this space. So um, what else uh, can, Ren, do you see something in the chat you can? I don't see anything. Uh, I just see someone saying it's so hard for women to stop themselves from apologizing, which I completely agree. It's true. Totally. Um, and then someone else saying the audience usually doesn't notice, which is true also. That's and true I also. think after this pandemic, the audience will just be so freaking grateful to get to listen to live music that they'll yeah. be they'll be overjoyed. <laughs> the audience will notice if you are a background thing. It's the beautiful thing of playing a restaurant gig is that you, you know, you're not the focus of attention, but if you're on stage, even if it's say at the cafe stretch jam, you're yeah. on a stage and sure there's a lot of other stuff going on, but um, if you screw up or people are vibing each other, there, there are enough people where they're gonna see it. A restaurant yeah. gig, sure, or they might not, might not notice, but yeah. I always think of every gig as being as if I was at Carnegie Hall. I think that's a great way to think about it and just make sure that you're bringing your best every time you go. So even if you're just starting out, you know, learn the song beforehand and really practice it and, and be able to, you know, deliver something that's worth watching um, and realize that people are there to be entertained, even if they're at a jam session, they want to yeah. be entertained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't see much other any other comments here but i think we could probably yeah, wrap it up wrap john it up unless anybody has something to ask uh, questions <laughs> stuff like that we covered pretty much everything we were going to talk about so yeah well you guys um that's uh, uh, awesome thanks so much for this lecture it's, it's like i learned a lot and and i've been playing for a long long time so <laughs> always uh, learning yeah so you know we're we'll um uh, We'll post this video online and we'll post all the connections <laughs> to books and records and everything of these uh, wonderful artists so that you can connect with them. And um, you can reach us if you wanna reach them for any kind of instruction. I don't know whether you guys do video online instruction or not, but- We if are you, right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, in, 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 moving forward and professionally, you know, um, uh, if, if you want to do that kind of thing, but uh, we're blessed to have you guys today and and um we um i just wanted to let everybody know that um this lecture series happens on the first sunday of every month uh and next month we're going to have carlton hister who is the uh head of the ucsc jazz department and has just been uh, uh asked to lead the danum program which is the digital arts and new music program which is an amazing program at ucsc right now um, <clears throat> so we'll be really lucky to have him and, uh, we don't have, uh, uh, we're not secure with the topic yet, but we're, we're working with that. So we're going to do this every month. And then on the second Sunday of every month, uh, we'll be hosting a jam session online at this same time. And you go to the same place to get the URL. If you want to participate, as it turns out, we'll play iReal Pro or a pianist will be the host of a song and everybody will solo one song after the other. So you'll basically unmute, take your take your uh, head through the <laughs> chorus, 
uh, you know, play through the chorus and the next person will play. And it's really been fun doing it. There's a little bit of a lag, but but it sounds like jazz. It's it, it's not like a, it's not it's not like a horrible lag, you know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm uh, was a professional pop musician before, so t timing is 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 a loose issue sometimes with jazz singers. But I don't know, man. I, that would bother me so much. But uh, more power to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, so we want to uh, thank you guys. And, and uh, we also want to ask if everybody would uh, consider donating to the Jazz Society because we want to keep affording hiring people. We're trying to hire jazz musicians when they're, many of them are out of work. It's a huge thing right now. If you're a jazz musician and you depend on gigs, you're in deep trouble. So we, we want to be uh, uh, helping jazz musicians out and, and, uh, and getting more jazz happening in Santa Cruz. And we have one of the best educational systems in the country in this little town that we're in. We have junior highs and high schools that have jazz programs. All the colleges and universities have jazz programs. So there's a lot of instruction in this area. We're blessed. And then, of course, San Jose State is amazing. Santa Clara, you know, we have all these resources in this in this area. We're blessed. So thank you all for coming. And uh, 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 thank you so much, Ren and John. Uh, you guys are uh, you're wonderful, and I can't wait to hear the next time you guys uh, play. I'll come over to Cafe Stritch when when it's safe to do oh so, gosh. and yeah. and uh, sit in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, and man. Thank you also to Suki Westling, who uh, great backup always. Uh, thanks, Suki. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Happy New Year, and we'll see you soon. See ya. Thank you. Bye bye. Ran. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ran. Bye bye, John. Bye.